for decades uh, working on projects based in Lesotho and archaeological projects. Um, at the moment, he's based in the UK and has held the position of Professor of African Archaeology and Tutor and Fellow in Archaeology at St. Hughes College since 1995. Um, and as a Western Cape branch, we'd also like to congratulate you on um, uh, assuming the position of President of the South African Archaeological Society for the period of 1 July uh, 2024 to the 30th of June 2026. I'm sure we're going to have a, a great, great two years. And um, in tonight's lecture, he's going to tell us about uh, Lesotho's archaeology and, and why it matters. I'm looking forward to seeing the pictures uh, properly, uh, at their proper size and uh, clarity. So thank you. I'll hand over to you. OK, uh, thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, good evening. Um, um, I'm not sure that it's 100 percent yet sunk in that I have the honor of being the president of the ARCSOC, but um, I'm delighted that that is the case, and uh, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity of speaking this evening, and more so of uh, planning to come to Cape Town for the ARCSOC's AGM uh, in uh, the southern autumn of next year. So hopefully we might actually be able to meet up in, in person at that point. Um, as Patricia was just alluding to now, uh, it's a little over two weeks ago that the Association of Southern African Professional Archaeologists met in Lesotho for the first time. And so it seems appropriate to ask now, as it did then, what is the broader international significance of Lesotho's archaeology? Why, if you live or work or research in South Africa or any of the other countries of the region, or if, like me, you come from much further afield, should you pay attention to it? I guess the answers to that could probably fill a book, but in the time available, I just want to focus on a few themes that I hope can convey the variety and the importance of Lesotho's archaeology. And if you haven't already been there, and I strongly recommend that you visit, some sense also of the beauty of its landscapes. So let's start off by giving a quick overview of what is often called Southern Africa's mountain kingdom, uh, which shares with the Vatican and San Marino in Italy, the unique distinction of being completely surrounded by another country. So Lesotho took on its present boundaries in uh, the 1860s after a series of wars with the Orange Free State Republic from 1865 to 68. And as a consequence of those wars, the whole of this area here from Clarence up in the north down towards Vepina in the south uh, the most fertile part of Lesotho was irretrievably lost. And as a result of that, Mushreshwe I, the first king of Lesotho, um, sought British protection of what remained. And that loss of fertile land to the west of the Caledon River impelled many Basotho to begin colonizing the mountains that today comprise the bulk of the country. Britain tried to hand over responsibility for what was then called Basutu land to the Cape Colony in 1871, but resistance by the Basutu to colonial demands to hand over firearms provoked an uprising known as the Gun War from 1880 to 1881. And as a result of that, Basutu land came back under direct British control in 1884. And it's because of that that it therefore remained outside what then became South Africa, resuming its independence under King Mushweshwe II in 1966. So originally, the word or the term Lesotho referred to the lowland areas in the west of the country, bordering the Free State, bordering the Caledon River. The highland areas that comprise most of the country, further to the east, as far as the Drakensberg Escarpment, were simply referred to in the past as Maluti, or mountains. And that division between lowlands and highlands remains useful in structuring discussion of Lesotho's past. But as you can see here in the top uh, series of pictures, the highlands themselves are heavily dissected by a series of rivers, most especially the Senku or Orange, as it becomes known when it crosses into South Africa, and its largest tributary in Lesotho, the Senkunyani. High up in uh, the mountains, um, as you can see at the top left, you have a series of basalt, lava, plateau, but the lower and middle reaches of these major rivers 
lie within areas of Clarence sandstone. And so they're home to hundreds of rock shelters, many of which house paintings or other kinds of archeological materials. And along with similar sites along tributaries of the Caledon in the lowlands of Lesotho, which you see here in the, in the bottom right, um, it's these sandstone shelters that have until relatively recently been the main focus of archeological research. So work on the prehistory or the, the, the more distant past of Lesotho in a sense was sparked off by um, historical accounts uh, and indeed observations of the very last hunter-gatherer groups to live in the Maluti Mountains. Um, works like uh, La Femme Tragique des Bouchemins published in 1933 by Victor Ellenberger. Um, the 1962 book Mountain Bushman of Basutaland by Marion Walsham Howe, who had married into the Ellenberger family of missionaries, uh, stand out here. And Victor's son, in fact, was um, one of the very first people in Lesotho to begin to collect stone tools. And he published a couple of uh, papers on that topic. But research really only got underway in a serious fashion with um, Patricia Vinicum. Living in Underberg in what is now KwaZulu-Natal, she started work in Lesotho prior to independence in the mid-1950s, um, beginning a decades-long uh, study of the country's rock art, ultimately locating and tracing dozens, perhaps, I'm not sure offhand, perhaps even hundreds of sites and certainly thousands and thousands of images. And she was joined in that from 1967 by her husband, Pat Carter. You can see the two of them there uh, with Pat rather meaningfully holding a Middle Stone Age implement uh, outside their excavations at Sir Hong Kong Shelter in 1971. That was not the first site they dug. The first site they dug was the site you see on the right here, Moshebi's Shelter in the Sashabatebi Basin in the southeast of Lesotho. They dug there together in 1969. That was the first ever professional archaeological excavation in Lesotho. And they took part in it together, but Patricia's main focus was always rock art, while Pat's was the excavation of Moshebis and other large rock shelter sites, with the intention ultimately, although it didn't come to fruition, of doing a joint study, a kind of joined up study of rock art on the one hand and dirt archaeology on the other. So over the course of the early 1970s, uh, Carter in particular uh, emphasized the excavation of three more very large rock shelters and was able to show that contrary to the wisdom of the time, people had been living up in the Maluti Mountains for tens of thousands of years. And at the same point, he developed an influential model of seasonal mobility that bears comparison with the early work of John Parkington in the Western Cape. So I'm not going to try and even explain all the details of this here, but essentially before he'd ever set foot in Lesotho to excavate, he'd come up with a model to suggest that people might move seasonally, spending the winters below the escarpment in KwaZulu-Natal, moving up into the eastern outskirts of Lesotho in the summer. And he later developed another winter-summer uh, upstream-downstream pattern of movement along the Senku River. Uh, using a variety of kinds of evidence, uh, some of which uh, were also being employed at more or less exactly the same time by John uh, at Elands Bay Cave and De Hangen in the Western Cape. And subsequent work by a number of other people has touched base with and suggested modifications to Carter's initial scheme. It's also worth noting here that in the course of developing this totally theoretical model when it was first proposed, Pat also um, suggested that most of the rock art that we find in the Maluti Drakensberg and any rituals that might have been associated with it would also likely have taken place in summer because summer would have been the time of year when more food was available and therefore people could have come together in larger groups for longer periods of time. And in thinking about that, he in a sense foreshadowed the rather influential model of seasonal aggregation and seasonal dispersal that Lynn Wadley 
subsequently uh, elaborated uh, towards the end of the 1980s. So after jointly excavating at the site of Medicani, which you'll see later in 1974, and after Patricia had surveyed part of the Senkunyani Valley here in 1976, Carter and Vinikin went their separate ways. They divorced. Patricia Vinikin went to live in Australia and work there. Pat Carter uh, took up uh, positions in the Archaeology Museum at Cambridge. And field archaeology in Lesotho went into a bit of a pause for more than a decade. For over um, 15 years, the only work that was done was that of John Parkington along the Southern Perimeter Road, which runs roughly around about here. Um, he and his team located a whole series of sites and excavated at two of them, including this small shelter, Bolachla. Um, and at the same time, the rock art along that southern perimeter road, as well as rock art in many other parts of the country, was photographed and uh, recorded in writing as part of the analysis of the rock art of Lesotho, the Aral project of Lucas Smits, who taught geography at Lesotho's National University. Um, I first visited the country in 1985, uh, helping, although perhaps it would be more accurate to say in retrospect, probably hindering Aral field worker Taule Tasele to document sites around Sir Hong Kong Rock Shelter, which you see here at the bottom middle of the slide. Um, I came back in 1988 and I began three years of field work at that time that included the first ever excavations on the western side of the country. So in the lowlands, in this area circled in yellow here on the map, digging at three major sites, Cloutle, which is near the university campus in Roma, and then two sites here on Tuana Tswana and Hamakatok, um, which we'll come back to a little bit later. And then when I uh, took up uh, a post briefly at UCT in 1992, I was able to go back to excavate the later Stone Age deposits at Sir Hong Kong as a kind of check and development on what Pat Carter had initially done. And in the process, discovered this site here, Di Kuaieng, which we'll come back to later on. And I worked there in 1995 and 1998. And all this time, the Lesotho Highlands Water Project had begun to impact on the country's archaeological heritage. And the various circles in red on the map here indicate areas where Highlands Water has um, undertaken dam construction or other kinds of engineering projects and identifies areas uh, within which archaeological fieldwork has taken place as a consequence. So on the rock art side, David Lewis Williams, and then on a larger scale, Yanni Lopsa uh, looked to see whether there would be rock art and where there was rock art, recorded it ahead of the Katsi Dam, and then down here in the Schlotzi Valley. And first I, and then uh, in, a, in a larger way, Jonathan Kaplan um, excavated at a number of sites here uh, that were thought to be a potential risk from phase 1A of the Highlands Water Project. And Jonathan subsequently did the archaeological work in advance of phase 1B, the Mahali Dam, down here in the centre of the country. So from the standpoint, uh, sorry, before I go on, let me just draw your attention to this area here, Podi Hadi in the northeast near Mokotlong, because I'll mention that again in a moment. And also the Metalong Dam in my original research area here on the Putiatsana River in the lowlands of Western Lesotho, just there. So from the standpoint of cultural heritage uh, and the impact that big projects like these dams can have on it, things took a rather more serious turn in 2008. Um, when Lesotho was embarking on the construction of the reservoir that you see here in the middle of this top slide. This is the Metalong Reservoir, uh, which was impounded not to um, send water to South Africa or to generate electricity, but to supply water to people in lowland Lesotho itself. And the World Bank approached me to develop a project ahead of the filling of that dam because I'd worked in that area 20 years before. And the project itself, which ran from 2008 to 2012 in terms of fieldwork, was completely designed and directed 
by uh, Charlie Arthur um, in the field. Uh, he and his team recorded over 50 sites. They excavated at four of them, including the two big shelters of Hamakatok and Antwana Tswana, which you can see under excavation at top right and down here also in the middle. Both of these sites occupation went back to about 60,000 years ago. Um, the work that we collectively did also involved recording uh, a whole series of rock art sites, and Lara Mallon is doing that at the bottom right. Uh, in some cases, it involved removing rock paintings that were threatened uh, by drowning. It involved developing an innovative program of radiocarbon dating and pigment analysis of rock art by Adelphine Bonneau from Canada. And importantly, it also involved the um, development, the training of a set of skilled Basutu field workers, some of whom you can see in these pictures, who have since gone on to work at a series of projects, both in Lesotho and in South Africa. And two of those projects are still ongoing. Uh, one of them, uh, which is on the left-hand side of this slide here, is the AMEMSA project of uh, Brian Stewart from the University of Michigan and Genevieve Dewar from um, uh, the University of Toronto, both of whom did their doctoral work on material from the Western Cape. Um, they have focused on re-excavating with far more precision and obviously many, many new uh, analytical techniques. Three of the big sites that Pat Carter dug back in the 1970s, Medikani and then Sahong Hong. And you begin to get a see sense, I think, here of the size of these sites. If you see the gentleman sitting up here on this rock ledge, and the person standing here in the middle of Medikani shelter, or the tents inside Sahong Hong. Uh, and this year, um, they've resumed excavation at this site, Hasaloja, which is a few hundred meters higher up and in the Sushlabatebi Basin in southeastern Lesotho, rather than along tributaries of the Orange as Medikani and Sahong Hong are. So this is the first project in Lesotho, which is currently ongoing. The other one involves Highlands Water, or is a response to Highlands Water, and it's a response to the construction of the latest dam at Podi Hadi. It's uh, field work that has been undertaken, uh, and the analysis is still being undertaken by a team led by uh, PGS Heritage, a South African consultancy company, uh, led initially in the field by Tim Forsman, whose photographs these are on the right, and more recently by Len van Skalkweg with input from John Parkington. Uh, and in fact, at the Lesotho meeting of ASAPA at the end of June, a whole session was dedicated to the work that has been going on in Potty Hadi, and the preliminary results of that are going to be published in the journal Azania uh, in December at the end of this year. So what I've done now is hopefully give you some idea of the scale and the diversity, the kinds of archaeology that people have been doing in Lesotho since Pat Carter first dug at Moshebis in 1969. But it's now time to ask again and to answer, why does all this matter? Why does Lesotho's archaeology merit recognition, not just on a locally Southern African scale, but also at a broader global level? So to answer that question, let's first have a look at this map, um, which tries to highlight two things. Firstly, where does most of our knowledge of Southern African hunter-gatherers come from? Well, quite obviously it comes mostly from the Kalahari, and also it comes from the 19th century records made by Willem Blake and Lucy Lloyd of San individuals in the Northern Cape who were living in or who came to live in Cape Town. And collectively, that work underpins the fact that Southern African hunter-gatherers appear, I think, in every introductory archaeology text, every introductory anthropology text in any university course in those two subjects that you would care to name. But that's a quite narrow range of environments. And an equally narrow range of settings also applies if we think about the main kinds of archaeological data sets that Stone Age fieldwork has accumulated over the past hundred years or so. Especially for the Middle Stone Age and the Pleistocene Later Stone Age, 
those settings still overwhelmingly emphasize the Cape and the South African coast or sites relatively close to that coast. So if we start at the left of that map, we've got pictures of uh, Elands Bay Cave, Deep Kluif, um, Pinnacle Point, Blombos, uh, Classes River, and then going up the, the uh, into KwaZulu Natal, we have Lynn Wadley's work at Sibudu, and then more recently at Vorda Cave. The point here is that those settings, the Kalahari savanna biome, the Nama Kuru biome, the Fainbos, are obviously far from exhausting the ecological variety that is Southern Africa. Lesotho then provides us with a vital counter narrative. I'm not saying it's unique in doing this, but it's important in doing this. It gives us a vital counter narrative to that coastal Kalahari emphasis. It encourages us to follow the advice of the Book of Psalms and to lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence may come our help. And as Pat Carter understood over 50 years ago, the importance of Lesotho in this respect is that it preserves multiple long sequence sites covering uh, the last 100,000 plus years. Those sites sometimes, not always, but certainly sometimes have good organic preservation. And they can inform us about how past hunter gatherers lived and how the environments in which they lived changed. Archives that are, to tell the truth, still really barely explored, but perhaps rich and plentiful enough that when Pat compared Lesotho to the famous Dodoin region of France, he was not overly exaggerating. Crucially, these archives in the Maluti Drakensberg Mountains of Lesotho come, of course, from inland settings, not ones that are on the coast or near the coast. And so any reconstructions of how people moved around, any reconstructions of how they, as it were, made a living, how did they organize themselves to find food, all of that is unaffected by fluctuations in global sea level over the last many, many tens of thousands of years. And as this map begins to hint, um, they actually exist here at some relatively high density. There's a great deal of work more, still to do, but enough perhaps to get a sense that it's not impossible to think that Lesotho might in due course give us enough observations from enough sites to begin to approximate the scale on which actual communities of people moved and lived something that currently is only really feasible in limited parts of the Cape. And so in forming this, we have these sites, these big rock shelters <laughs> that Pat Carter first excavated at the end of the 1960s and in the beginning of the 1970s that have now been redug since. Uh, Medikani, Hasaloja, and Sahong Hong, redug by Brian Stewart and Genevieve Dewar, and Moshebi's shelter, where the later Stone Age, the Holocene deposits, were redug by Charlie Arthur. We've also got the extraordinary sequence at the site of Dikanong, which Kira Pazan and colleagues are digging, well, perhaps not literally now, because I imagine it's dark, but they're certainly digging there at this, at the, in this week, um, literally therefore, almost as we speak. And you can get a sense of the strangeness of Dikanong by, um, just noting here that the deposits all exist outside the rock shelter. There's nothing inside this rock shelter at all. No stone tools, no rock arts, no sediments. The archaeology is all up this slope. And those of you who know him, this figure here and on the right here is Jason Orton, who is what, about 1 meter 85, 188. This is an enormously long sequence of archaeology and um, hopefully Kira and colleagues will be finding new examples of the bone tools, for example, that they were talking about at the ASAPA conference in deposits that, according to their preliminary dates, reach back at least 100,000 years. So again, we have here a really important site with a very, very long sequence of occupation exceeding the antiquity of the other sites that you see in that slide, exceeding also 
the antiquity of Antoine Tswana and Hamakatok in the west of Lesotho, where I dug in the 1980s, and which Charlie Arthur then redug far more carefully, far better, uh, ahead of the flooding of the Metalong Dam. And again, discovering things that we had no idea about before. So um, at both sites, he, um, to my surprise, um, encountered uh, Roberg assemblages characterized by these tiny little bladelets and bladelet cores, which date to uh, roughly um, 15 to 10,000 years ago, something like that. And at Hamakatok, he also discovered a series of Middle Stone Age uh, assemblages, including this rather nice point, for example. And again, I had had no inkling of that at all when I dug there back in 1989. Um, so on the western side of Lesotho, as well as in the mountains in its east, we've got potential to begin to explore late Pleistocene archaeology at relatively high resolution, and to do so in environments that are quite different from those of the Cape. To take this a little bit further, if we go to the Potihadi area of the uh, eastern, northeast of Lesotho, uh, an area that is soon going to be flooded by another of Highlands Waters dams, one of the interesting things to come out of Lenf and Skalkvik's work there is that we have evidence of hominins making Asherlian hand axes being present up there higher than two and a half thousand meters above sea level. Um, something previously unknown gives us a Southern African counterpart to something that is otherwise only attested that early in terms of exploiting montane high altitude environments in the mountains of Ethiopia. And of course, as that top left slide and more particularly perhaps this bottom slide of Sahong Gong show, this high elevation, topographically complex, dissected environment subject to cold conditions today and surely significantly colder ones for much of the Pleistocene is not the Kalahari. It's really nothing like the Kalahari or the Northern Cape from which Blake and Lloyd's Bushman informants came. And so my second point here then is that analogies that we draw from San ethnography to help us understand the archaeology of Southern Africa may not work here, or at least may not work readily. They may not be the only thing that we should be thinking about. Hunter-gatherers may have had to organize themselves quite differently from our conventional Kalahari-based expectations of how people might behave. And as an example of that, uh, Brian Stewart and I, in a paper which we called Beyond the, or Brian wanted to call, uh, Beyond the Shadow of a Desert, um, tries to argue the case for encouraging us to engage with broader kinds of hunter-gatherer theory that are not restricted to Kalahari, Kalahari analogies. So without going into too much detail, the basic point of the paper was that uh, we were interested in exploring the worldwide data set of hunter-gatherer ethnography compiled by the American archaeologist Lewis Binford. And one of the things that Binford does in this huge data set is to suggest that when effective temperature which is a kind of measure of both seasonality and biological productivity. When this falls below a certain threshold, it's 12.75 degrees, and it surely did that at the maximum of the last ice age in the late glacial, and again between about two and 3,000 years ago here, hunter-gatherers turn to other resources because plants become too scarce. Binford suggests, for example, that they may turn to marine mammals. Now, obviously, people in Lesotho did not have access to seals and whales, but instead they did have access to freshwater fish. And the point of our paper was to demonstrate that during these significantly colder episodes, which are shaded in gray on that graph at the, at the right of the slide, people intensified their exploitation of fish. And we showed that through our analysis of the faunal assemblages from excavations that I did in the 1990s 
at Hong Kong Rock Shelter in the middle and at the site of Dikwaying, uh, a few kilometers away, which I'm going to talk about now uh, in a little bit more detail, just as an example of the kinds of sites that the Sutu has to offer. And um, you'll see this again in the next slide, but just to make clear where we are here, um, this is the bed of the Orange River, of the Senku, um, in early September, which explains why it's relatively dry. And this is the bank, and set back from the bank, let me just go back again for one moment, set back from the bank uh, is an archaeological site. And the archaeological site is essentially where this arrow is, and it's just before you get to a little stream called the Dikwaeng, which comes into the orange here. Dikwaeng means the place of the tobacco plants. And the reason for that is because when the first Basutu settled the area at the end of the 1870s, they found tobacco growing there. And uh, there's an oral history and oral tradition from the local village, uh, which is a couple of kilometers back into those mountains. Uh, there's an oral history which says that those tobacco plants had been planted and were being cared for by local San hunter gatherers. So um, this is another view of Dikwaeng. You can see where it sits now within the Senku Valley as a whole. This is the Hong Kong Valley coming into the main Senku just here. And this is a footbridge across the orange which was kindly provided by the Swedish government in the late 1980s. And you can see this as an air photograph here with the Senku flowing downstream towards South Africa and the archeological site is in here. And my, this is a very much younger representation of myself, as you can tell. And what attracted my attention here was that the site, uh, was that there was a series of dark bands in the sediment profile and going closer, most of them were packed with bone, especially fish bone and stone tools. And clearly people had been present here on multiple occasions over time. So that was why we went back and dug there in 1995 and again in 1998. So what we have here is a, an open air site. It dates to the last 3000 or so years. People repeatedly came there. And the reason that they probably came there so often so many times was to intercept spawning runs of fish moving upstream just in front of the site here along the Senku River in spring and summer. So the fish that we're talking about here are, so let me just go, no, no, let me, I'll come back to the fish in one moment. Let, let, let's just introduce you to the site still further. Catching fish uh, using both spears and traps and as Further evidence of that, if we go round the corner from the archaeological site, which is here, this is my excavation area here, we go round the corner, literally from here, and go onto the canyon of the Dikwaeng stream. This is Sam Chalice from Rari in Johannesburg, perched, to my mind, very precariously on the top of a five meter high uh, ladder recording rock art. And what we have here, among various other images, is uh, the traces of a rain animal in association with um, uh, a series of um, images, some of which certainly give the impression of being fish. Um, so Dikwaeng began life as a rock shelter, so we think. Um, that rock shelter is now buried underneath the accumulation of meters and meters of sediment outside it, but it probably runs several meters this way, parallel to the river, and maybe of some size, judging from some of the ones that Patricia Vinicom uh, recorded paintings at further downstream. And you can see that the lower part of the excavation area samples deposits that are trending downslope towards the river and have relatively largish lumps of sandstone in them. We think these are the tailor slopes of that rock shelter. And that what happened was that when the sediments had filled the rock shelter completely, people kept on coming back, but instead camped now outside it. And that's what we have here in these dark, much more horizontal rock-free bands 
above the, uh, the lower part of the deposit. The occupation horizons are separated by archaeologically sterile silts laid down by the river. They must have been laid down very, very rapidly uh, because we've got very good preservation of bone, um, really quite outstanding formal preservation. Ina Plach, who at the time was working at what was then the Transvaal Museum, kindly analyzed the fauna from the excavation. Um, she estimated that from the excavated area, and it's worthwhile pointing out that that is only part of the maximum extent of the surviving deposit, which itself, of course, is only part of the original site. From that excavated area, she thought that we had probably recovered about 1.3 million fish bones. Um, she identified somewhat over 61,000 specimens. So not only do we have remarkable faunal preservation, we also have the opportunity to see how people were using this site across time, and as you'll see in a moment, also across space. Let me illustrate that first. We obviously only dug a relatively small area, um, but something in the order of about 32 square meters in the uppermost horizons. And what is of interest here is that the quality of the preservation suggests that we could pick up some aspects of the way in which people had organized themselves in space. So this is layer three, which dates to the early third century AD. And it has a series of halves, one, two, three, four, uh, arranged more or less in a line that is parallel to the rock behind, which is where we think the shelter is, and parallel to the river in front. Um, we have stone artifacts and bone around these halves. Um, uh, and we have some instances in which some of those stone artifacts clearly refit with each other. So we've probably got individual napping events. We've also got a quite tight cluster of ostrich eggshell beads in this area here, which is probably, um, judging from the concentration and judging from the um, very tight distribution in their size, I suspect the loss of a single item of beadwork. And we've got comparable kinds of patterning in at least two layers below this as well, two older layers below this. Um, what's interesting here is that the arrangement of the hearths um, leaves space behind each of them, between hearth and rock face, which is almost exactly of the correct dimension for the kind of windbreak that is reported in the Kalahari, the shelters that people have built in the Kalahari, where they store their equipment, uh, and um, perhaps retire in bad weather. And the organization here then is linear, however, not circular, as you would find in many, many Kalahari instances. So looking for arrangements of how people organize themselves in space was one of the positive features of digging at Dikwayeng. Another relates to what people were actually doing when they were there. It's clear that they were catching fish, but interestingly, the fish species that they were catching shift over time. So there is a focus more heavily on yellowfish, that's labiobarbus, which is black and purple in these diagrams here, sorry, um, early on, and then much, much more of the smaller labiocapensis, the orange river mudfish, uh, as we move forward in time. And that's probably a reflection if we look into the environmental indicators that we were able to get uh, from things like charcoal and phytoliths. It's probably a reflection of the fact that the mudfish is more plentiful in these river systems as temperatures warm up. And what we're seeing then is a shift in uh, species emphasis linked to environmental change that is also connected to a switch in the timing of when people are coming. So early on, we're looking probably at a focus more in summer, and then later on, we're looking at more of a focus in spring. And then the final thing uh, that Dikwaying uh, allows, or, or the final thing that I want to mention here to which Dikwaying speaks, is simply the scale on which people were fishing. Um, you can see that Labio Capensis, which is at the top left, is not particularly large, but yellowfish 
certainly can be. And we need to bear in mind here that, of course, as I said before, my excavation only looked at part of the surviving deposits, which are themselves part of the original site, given that some of it has been eroded away over time by the Orange River. So in layer three, the one that I showed you the diagram of a couple of minutes ago, Inaplach's um, identifications suggest we have at least 153 individual fish that equates, when you allow for the weights of the different species, to at least 400 kilos of fish, most of which is edible. Um, given that most of the fish bones couldn't be identified, and given that, as the diagram here at bottom left shows, um, we have specimens here that are way bigger than the known angling record for Southern Africa. Um, it's probably reasonable to think that in layer three, and again in the horizons, the occupations that preceded it, whenever people came, we're looking at them capturing well over a ton of fish in just a few weeks. Capturing it using basket traps or uh, fences of the kind shown in the rock art image at top right, but also by using projectile weapons. These are probably, these are um, the skull fragments of fish from Dikwaying showing circular perforations that precisely match the size of bone points from the site. And we think that therefore what we're looking at here is possibly people shooting at fish with bone arrow or else spearing them with a single uh, pronged uh, spear. Why would they be interested in capturing so many fish? The reason I think is that spawning is pretty predictable. You know where the fish will be, and you also know more or less when they're gonna be there. And the fish are giving you a bonanza of fat and protein at a time of the year in spring, early summer, when plants are still relatively scarce, and when game animals are still in fairly poor condition. And the temporary aggregations that fishing at somewhere like this would make possible will then have given people opportunities to hunt antelope like eelant, as they also migrated upstream, and in their cases, uphill, upslope, to take advantage of summer grazing. And as you may know, Brian Stewart and Sam Chalice have recently published a paper in the transactions of the Royal Society of South Africa, which I think brilliantly develops a compelling argument that links these kinds of subsistence strategies uh, in ways that provide a context uh, for the emergence of shaded polychrome paintings in the rock art and the elaboration of the connections, the symbolic links between elant, snakes, aquatic animals in general, and the rain with a capital R that characterize rock art across the Maluti Drakensberg uh, as a whole. So this brings us now to rock art. And as Adelphine Bonneau's work at Metalong uh, has shown, we now know that some of the rock art in the Maluti Drakensberg mountains of Lesotho and the McClear Barclay East area of the Northeastern Eastern Cape is at least 3000 years old. And I don't think anyone can have any doubt that these paintings express beliefs that were central to how people lived their lives and how they understood the world around them. And this brings me to the third reason why Lesotho's archeology span matters at a Southern African scale and at an international level. Only here, in the whole of Southern Africa, can we access an indigenous voice from a community where painting was still taking place that directly tells us what some of that art meant. That voice is, of course, that of the uh, Bushman man King, who was the guide to Joseph Orpen, the man you see here in the middle, and James Grant on their expedition through the Maluti Mountains uh, in the end of 1873, uh, as Sam Chalice and I published 
some years ago when when we when we reproduced uh, James Grant's uh, diary of this expedition. And as I'm sure you know, um, Orpen took advantage of his um, uh, of of this opportunity to chat to King and to take down and then ultimately publish in 1874 uh, various myths and legends that he was told. But he also sketched some examples of Lesotho's rock art, A, B, and C at the top there. Um, A is from Medikani, where you see Yanni Lopsa tracing here. B is at Sahong Hong, where you see Stefan Grab of Witz University walking out. And C is here at Pitsaneng, which is a small rock shelter about a kilometer or so upstream from Sahong Hong. They were men who had died and now lived in rivers and were spoilt at the same time as the Ilant and by the dances of which you have seen paintings. That's part of what King said to Orpen when he was trying to explain what these paintings meant. He did this with reference to the paintings that you see here at Medikani. Uh, this is Orpen's, sorry, this is Orpen's original sketch here. And you can see that what Orpen did was in fact to abstract those three antelope headed figures from a more complicated scene and slightly reorganize them. What you see uh, in the middle is in fact Patricia Vinicom's tracing of that scene from 1974. And what you can see above it is my photograph of it from 1990, which shows both the acuteness, I think, of Patricia's vision and the deterioration of the rock art in the years since she was there. King also gave an explanation of the scene that you see in the bottom center, which is from Sahong Hong. And this is a scene that he explained in terms of beliefs about rainmaking. Um, those explanations have been fundamental to our understanding of Bushman rock art in Southern Africa since David Lewis Williams echoing the observations of Willem Blake in 1874, realized their importance in the 1970s. In fact, I would say that they are so foundational to rock art research in Southern Africa and beyond, as well as to the social turn in later Stone Age archaeology, the uh, interest in looking at more social questions like gift exchange and gender, that began to take place in the late 1980s and 1990s, that were they better preserved, Medikani, Sohong Hong, and Pitsaneng would surely merit recognition as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So for my fourth point, let me change focus completely and look at something much more recent in time. 200 years ago this year, so back in 1824, Meshweshwe I led his followers south from Butabute in the north of Lesotho to settle the stronghold of Tababasiu, part of which you see here uh, in front of you. That natural fortress provided him with the base from which to build a new state, to secure its autonomy in the face of attack, and to build also the institutional strength and sense of national identity that allowed Lesotho to escape incorporation into what ultimately became South Africa. Now that experience of nation building, the conversion to Christianity that was associated with it, and in fact the university where the Asaba conference took place was originally set up as a theological college uh, because it is in the settlement where the first Catholic missionaries arrived in the 1860s. They were about 35 years after the first Protestant missionaries. So that experience of nation building, of conversion to Christianity, and of the mid late 19th century colonization of the highlands of Lesotho associated among other things with the acquisition of new resources like maize, framed here by the Duke of Sussex, um, collectively outline a whole series of questions that I put on the 
right hand side of the slide here. These questions, without going into them in any detail, are questions that are of archaeological relevance across southern Africa and indeed beyond. And over the last uh, 20 years or so, a number of people like Sam Chalice and Rachel King and Margaret Vale have used rock art, archives, field surveys, excavations to a limited extent, and even the analysis of adhesives that were used to mount stone tools to start exploring the complex dynamics of intercultural contact and transformation that characterized Lesotho in the 19th century. As examples of that, we have evidence in the rock art for the acquisition of horses and the use of horses not only as animals on which to hunt and ride and move over the landscape, but also the incorporation of horses into people's worldviews and their beliefs about themselves, beliefs that were also heavily associated with a kind of common language of belief linked to shared ideas about baboons, ideas shared between Bushman on the one hand and Amakosa on the other, as Sam Chalice has talked about. And from the uh, surprisingly, from the stone tool point of view, uh, Margaret Vale was able to show that at least two of the stone tools from the very topmost deposits at Hong Kong were mounted in uh, adhesives that used paraffin and pine resin and castor oil that must have been acquired through trade with Basutu or with European settlers in the course of the 19th century. Completed last year, the doctoral work of Untabiseng Mokwena, Lesotho's only archaeology lecturer, has complemented this with extensive fieldwork at Tabo Basiu itself. And our own work at the Metalong Dam saw the country's first archaeologically related investigations of living heritage, something that has been developed much further now in work at the Poti Hadi Dam. So as examples of this, uh, Undadi Michael Makokela uh, of the village directly opposite Antwana Tswana explained that these stone hollows in the uh, bedrock were used to make protective medicine during the gun war against the Cape Colony in 1880 to 1881. Slightly upstream, there were pools that were used for uh, uh, baptism services. And a little bit downstream, we were able to get um, uh, information from Undari Khorai Neko about how the village of Hamakwanyani, which was impacted by some of the uh, facilities associated with the Metalong Dam, how people had actually structured their living space within this village before it was abandoned, and he and other people left it eventually in the 1960s. And there's no doubt that taking this kind of living heritage into account when designing and mitigating future development projects is an absolutely essential component of any uh, future cultural resource management work in Lesotho. And equally, that collectively, this marks a series of projects that will, I hope, make Lesotho's recent past a key uh, source for understanding how Southern Africa's present came to be. And that's important for my final point, which again is illustrated by some of the work that Charlie Arthur and colleagues uh, undertook at the Metalong Dam. For Lesotho's archaeology to flourish, it has to speak to the concerns and interests of people in Lesotho. That's a truism, of course, that holds across every country in Southern Africa, every country in the world, and is obviously an objective that is absolutely central to the ArcSoc's own activities. But it's probably also true that as archaeologists, we don't always find it easy to make our work engaging or relevant to the broader public that ultimately pays for it. And these challenges, of course, in Southern Africa are compounded by historical imbalances in who has the chance of joining the archaeological profession. Now, while not every component of our work came to fruition, the work that Charlie, who's standing here in the middle, um, undertook at Metalong stands out, I think, as an example of how these goals can be met. How so? 
So when we started this work, we were very much aware that the Highlands Water Project had, up until that point, conspicuously failed to create any local archaeological capacity inside Lesotho at all, notwithstanding recommendations that dated back to the mid-1980s. We also knew that it was very difficult for obvious economic reasons to retain Basutu with postgraduate training in archaeology inside the country, given the opportunities that might exist in South Africa. So in order to address these issues, Charlie built the sustained transfer of archaeological skills into the 18 months of continuous fieldwork that he directed from 2008 to 2010, and again into the excavations that followed in 2012. Significantly, the initial group of trainee archaeologists on our project emerged directly from the enthusiasm and interest of members of the local community itself. Working with professional archaeologists from South Africa, from Europe and Australia on the project, these individuals uh, rapidly acquired the skills to run small excavations of their own and to interpret as well as to record what they were finding. Exposure to finds processing and to recording rock art uh, followed, complemented by regular bilingual newsletters, as you saw on the previous slide, regular community members, uh, sorry, regular community meetings and outreach, and also, as you can see here, newspaper and TV presentations. And aware that Basutu archaeologists might struggle to find work once our own work at Metalong came to an end, we then facilitated their employment with Brian Stewart and Genevieve Dewar at Hong Kong, and then with Sam Chalice on his Mara project at Matatiel. Since then, they've been at the core of field work elsewhere, including at Poti Hadi now for many years. And in fact, some of them are going to take part in excavations at Rose Cottage Cave near Lady Brand in the Free State in the next few months. They are themselves now members of the Association of Southern African Professional Archaeologists. Others, including Untabiseng Mokwena, who teaches archaeology at the National University of Lesotho, went on to study archaeology at graduate level at WITS and at UCT. And although the details of what we were able to do may be specific to Metalong, or specific to Lesotho, I think that the emphasis that we placed, or rather I should say Charlie placed, because I, I don't want to take away from him, it was very much his work, not mine. The emphasis Charlie placed on sharing responsibility for excavation and recording at every single stage of field work across all members of the team at every stage can surely be replicated more widely to build archaeological capacity where it did not previously exist and to help archaeologists successfully tackle the demands of disciplinary transformation in Southern Africa. For Lesotho, the next stage of that has to involve strengthening archaeological infrastructure across the National University, the Ministry of Culture, and the yet to open National Museum in ways that can also promote including Lesotho nationals, not just in executing projects, but in designing them from the start. Achieving that will, I think, further demonstrate the international importance of Lesotho's archaeology. Collectively, it will also reinforce understanding of where we and Lesotho have come from, where we and it may yet go, of allowing heritage to generate revenue in ways that benefit ordinary people at site level, and of building societal resilience in the face of the growing threats posed to Lesotho and to the rest of us by climate change, biodiversity loss, and the overexploitation of vulnerable ecologies. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much. Um, that was a really, really interesting presentation. I, yeah, I heard it at a SAFA, but uh, definitely more impactful um, seeing it again. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions um, 
you can raise your hand and uh, kind of uh, turn on your microphone and camera to ask your question, or you can post a question in the chat and then I'll read it out so that we can uh, respond that way. Everyone's just kind of blown away by how much there actually is in the city. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and hopefully about how, if you haven't been there also, by how beautiful it is. I mean, mm -hmm. it is a rugged landscape, but but I, I I do think it's a very beautiful landscape. It is, yes. Um, I wonder if I could ask a question. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Uh, so my name's uh, Tim Hoffman. <clears throat> um, oh. Hi, Peter. I'm not an archaeologist. I know nothing about archaeology. I'm a botanist, but um, uh, I'm interested in, uh, perhaps you did touch on this, but I'm interested in, you mentioned um, perhaps a counter-narrative once more work is done to that, uh, into the kind of narrative that's happened because, uh, you know, derived from studies uh, from people on the lowlands more. Um, mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about what the elements of that um, counter narrative might be, and would it necessarily be counter, or would it be more complementary? You think? Um, yes. Something like that. Yeah. Perhaps you could just uh, talk talk yeah. to that a little bit. Thanks. Yes. Peter. Uh, perhaps perhaps um, perhaps counter narrative is 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 me being a little bit um, beating my own drum. Uh, complementary is perhaps a better word um and i think complementary is, is a better word actually because um there is a sense in which so much of what we know about the middle stone age and the latest stone age comes from high quality excavations in a relatively small number of ecological settings and those settings for very good historical reasons tend to privilege uh the feinbos and the forest biomes of the Cape with some further work up in KwaZulu Natal. Relative to um, uh, those areas, places like the, uh, what, what David Lewis Williams once called the Southeastern Mountains, by which he means essentially Lesotho, or as David Thomas, uh, the Oxford geographer pointed out at the Lesotho conference, uh, the Kalahari, the archaeology of these areas is very much more low key. And that's because there's simply been less done. Um, but they occupy very different kinds of terrain, different kinds of ecology. They are not, as I said, going to be affected by sea level fluctuations in the way that um, coastal sites in the Cape may be, where clearly we know at times people will have been out on what is now the drowned coastal plain and that at other times when we can see occupation in coastal rock shelters, therefore, um, what we see may be almost the tip of the iceberg in, the, in that we see what they're doing at places like Elands Bay Cave or Classes River, but we, don't really, we can't really gauge what was happening 10, 20 kilometers away because it's now under the Indian or the Atlantic Oceans. Um, we're looking, therefore, at different terrains. We're looking at different ecologies, different kinds of landscape. We're looking at different kinds of resources. So um, when, when I slightly jokingly said, well, of course, in Lesotho, if things get cold, you can't turn to um, marine mammals like beached whales or Cape fur seal as an alternative to plants. Equally, you can't turn to rich coastal shellfish resources of the kind that um, I'm going to say litter, but, but, but I'm not using that pejoratively, but that mark the South African coast. That doesn't exist here. Um, so we've got to think about different kinds of basic resources that people can use. And I think what Lesotho and other locations in the interior can offer is a greater variety of insights into how hunter-gatherers made a living, how they structured their lives, um, above and beyond what we already know from the Cape. That, 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 I think, is what I was trying to get at in terms of uh, complementary or different kinds of narrative. Um, and I think Lesotho is one of those places that has a lot of potential in this regard. 
certainly sounds like there's a lot to explore there. The huge amount to explore. Huge amount to explore. If 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 um just to give you an idea, within this within that stretch of the valley that you see there mm -hmm. along the orange, there are at least um and, and from where I'm taking the photograph to that bridge is about a kilometer. So we're not looking at a very big distance. Mm -hmm. There are at least a dozen archaeological sites. Oh wow. Um many of them with deposit, most of them with paintings. And that, and I'm not including any surface scatters of stone tools that may be, for example, that are up here or that may be up here. Mm -hmm. um, it's a rich landscape. Go work oh. there. <laughs> Students, I hope you're listening. <laughs> Patricia. Yes, uh, Jean, I see, oh, you. Paul, I see your camera. Paul had sent a question through. I don't know if it came through. It was on a question and an answer. I couldn't find chat. Did Let's it come through? Uh, yes, I see it. I see it's just come through. Uh, was any evidence found of possible use of types of hooks or such like, apart from spears and arrows? Some of the depictions indicate very large baskets or nets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there is one bone hook from Dikwayang that we found, which I think personally I'd rate as the most beautiful artifact that came out of the excavation. <laughs> um, there are bone hooks from other sites in, uh, in the Lesotho Highlands. And I suspect, yes, people were also um, catching fish on occasion by angling for them. Um, as well as that, in fact, um, one of the elders from the village, which is sort of up here, when we were digging here in the 1990s, said that he also remembered that um, in his youth, there'd been quite extensive reed beds along the edge of the river here. And that um, uh, when fish spawn, you could actually just pick some of them up out of you know they, they were just thrashing around so much and they were at such high density you could just pick them up with your bare hands so i think there's probably a variety of methods being used perhaps with a degree of specificity in terms of which fish are you going for at what particular time of the year i suspect traps are probably or uh much more useful during actual spawning runs I suspect that um, if you were to go there now at this time of the year in winter, uh, when I've certainly seen fish pooling together in, in some of the deeper uh, pockets of the riverbed, uh, just the other side of the bridge here, um, uh, angling would probably be a much, much better technique to use. And, and perhaps those hooks would therefore come into their own there. Thank you. <clears throat> Emily, did, Emily, did you still want to ask a question? Hi, thanks, Patricia. Hi, Peter. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more of a personal question, actually. After having been there now in the landscape, one is always sort of, um, one rekindles one's curiosity. And I was wondering if there's a personal interest or question that got peaked for you when you were there with all this research that be, that's been done, whether there's a question that's come up for you that you would want to have looked into. Okay. so. The one thing that I might have done that I didn't end up doing for combination of reasons would have been to go back to Dikwayeng and to dig out more of it to really look into that rock shelter because it would fascinate me to know whether there is also deposit inside that uh, mm -hmm. and indeed whether that deposit might go back beyond what it was that we were able to bottom out in our excavation immediately in front of that that sandstone ridge if you like uh, we got down five and a half meters uh, and at the very very bottom of the excavation sure. which was only a a a three and a half square meter area um, I asked for volunteers and 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 took the, the, the tallest of my students, who was a little bit taller than me, so it's sort of 180, 185. Um, the two of us went down there, and I had a local guy perched on the edge with instructions that if everything fell in on top of us, he was to try and pull us out. Uh, luckily, nothing happened. But um, I know from very, very rapid excavation below the oldest 
deposit that um, there is more sediment. There wasn't anything archaeological in it, but of course, that doesn't mean to say that there might not be something archaeological still further down. And that would be a really interesting thing to, uh, to go after. Um, Hand axes and big stuff come from. Cool. Thank down. you. I, I was also wondering if there's any sort of new new techniques or something specifically that you would think would be useful now that that you didn't have available. I mean, there's lots from from when you guys were doing research, but if there's any new techniques, I mean, some of them came out at Asapa, but something that was also interesting for you that you would want to use in the research, maybe like really good scaffolding by the sounds of it. But <laughs> <laughs> well, and <laughs> and, and, and also. <laughs> and, and, and and also um, a lot of money because um, I mean the problem the problem and, and, and th th this was, this was one of the reasons why I didn't do this was that uh, we backfilled the site but backfilling a 32 square meter area is an awful mm. lot of backfill um, mm. and of course you can't go down without going sideways because you need to have enough space within which to work and to work tolerably safely. Uh, and the problem with doing that is that as you go sideways, you are, of course, removing archaeology. You can't just dig through it. You've actually got to excavate it properly. And, 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 and it would have required an awful lot of field work over a very long period of time. And I'm afraid that since I was last excavating there while my wife was pregnant and there was no way of contacting her for the two months that I was on site, um, I also had family reasons as to why I didn't go back and do any further excavation there. Um, but I think it, it, it would be an interesting thing for somebody to do. Um, in terms of um, techniques, well, one of the things that we eventually applied here um, and showing how things evolve, you know, we found pottery, uh, a small amount of pottery, right in the topmost occupation layer, De Quayang. And one of those sherds was decorated uh, with a crisscross pattern, incised crisscross pattern. And even I, as a Stone Age archaeologist, could identify that as being Iron Age. Uh, and Tim Maggs and Gavin Whitelaw, in fact, identified it as probably on Seleucian Dodon Wan, which is sort of 7th, 8th century AD. And so therefore, almost certainly from KwaZulu Natal. Many, many years later, we eventually found a graduate student who was interested in looking at the organic residues on the pottery from here and from my earlier excavations at Hong Kong. And she identified a wheat fish, which is not a big surprise. She identified ruminants, so antelope, again, not a big surprise. But she also identified dairy, which was a big surprise. Um, and so we have dairy residues on some of this pottery. Two of the sherds, she was able to get direct dates on those fatty acids, which go back to the first millennium AD. And the beauty of this is that when Ina Plach was analyzing the animal bones from the two sites, she identified very small numbers of sheep and cattle. And so what I think this demonstrates is that while the historical, you know, the history says the first farmers to get up here came in 1878 from the west of Lesotho and they established the village at Hong Kong, which is just the other side of this rise here. Some of the hunter gatherers who were up here in the first millennium had access to livestock, I think probably livestock of their own. So there's an interesting uh, question to be researched further here about what scale was that on? Why did it happen? What kind of connections are we looking at to Iron Age farmers on the other side of the Drakensberg? Uh, how widespread was this? How long lived was it? Was it episodic? Was it more continuous? Whole series of questions. So to go back to your, your question about, you know, what, what else would be worth looking at? That might be worth looking at as well. Great. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank you. Pleasure.
Don't see any other hands. And I think for now the questions are <laughs> have been asked. Uh, thanks again, uh, Peter. That was a really, really interesting talk. And thanks, yeah, thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you. And uh, I hope that um, you might all be um, at the meeting in Cape Town that I think is going to be scheduled for April, but I'm very much looking forward to coming out and uh, and attending. Thank you all very much indeed. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you there. Yeah. Thank you.